Well, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to the Environmental Education Webinar Series. My name is John Worth. I'm a volunteer with the North Coventry Township Environmental Advisory Council. This is the fourth in our series of four webinars that we've held this summer. Um, I do want to especially thank the North Coventry Township Board of Supervisors and our Township Manager, Erica, for all their help and support in uh, putting this together. Uh, tonight's presentation is titled uh, Hawk Identification for Beginners. It's presented by Vince Smith. Vince is the president of the Valley Forge Audubon Society. That is, for those of you who live in North Coventry Township, your local chapter of the Audubon Society. Um, and in fact, it is the local chapter for anyone in uh, Chester, Delaware County, most of Montgomery County, and even some of Philadelphia counties. Um, and Vince will go through his presentation tonight, and then hopefully at the end of it, we'll actually have time for a few questions. So what I will ask is um, if you do have a question to ask Vince, uh, within the Zoom meeting, you can go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little button that says chat. Uh, you can tap on that or click on that and type in a question. I will be monitoring those questions and at the end of Vince's seminar, we will uh, hopefully get to all of those questions. And I would certainly encourage you to ask him some very difficult questions. <laughs> Try to challenge him a little bit. <laughs> so with that, Vince, I will turn it over to you. And thank, thank you, John. I appreciate the opportunities to speak with everybody today. I, pr I appreciate the, the Coventry Township and the EAC for giving me this opportunity. Just as a little bit of a pre-introduction, just so you know, this is the first time we are doing one of these presentations. So if you do have some feedback, we're, we're open to that. So please feel free to do so. Um, second thing, I, I do want to uh, thank also uh, Pat and Tony Mistassi for all their help with this presentation. And just as a little bit of a heads up, uh, I am going to have a quiz at the end of the presentation. So if you would like to get your pen and paper and want to take down any notes along the way, please feel free to do. We will go over the quiz at the end of the uh, presentation and I will give you the answers. So, so with that, um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to begin. Oh, a little bit of a pre-setup for that. And part of it has to do with, um, I did want to make a specific mention about the uh, North Coventry in particular. I have just started to bird watch in the location, thanks to Patty and John Worth. And you guys really have some wonderful habitat. And um, I wanna let you know that a fair number of the species that we're gonna talk about tonight actually do nest in your township. And I cannot say that about where I live. I live a little bit further east outside of Phoenixville. And you guys still have an awful lot of intact habitat and natural habitat. And because you have that, you actually have all these wonderful species. And it includes not only the hawks, but also all the other birds also. Um, so with that, I guess we'll get into hawk identification for beginners. And um, just by way of introduction, we're gonna be going through just some resources. These are resources that I use in order to help me to learn um, how to identify hawks. We're gonna talk a little bit about the migration overview. And right now is the time of the year when a lot of these hawks are beginning their migration. So this is a good time of year to get out there and take a look for some of these hawks. And we're also gonna talk about some local areas to watch migrating hawks. And you'll find that there's many within our local area. Uh, we're gonna talk about some different types of hawks and, the and some different raptors. And in short, we're gonna try to give you some tips for identifying these hawks based on size, shape, and color patterns, and also flight, because some of them have very distinctive flight patterns. Some of the resources that I use, uh, highly recommend Hawks in Flight, David Sibley, Pete Dunn, uh, and Clay Sutton. Very good resource. Uh, Hawks of North America, that's the Peterson uh, Field Guides. And then Hawk Watch, a guide for beginners. That is uh, a wonderful presentation, or a presentation of 
how to identify uh, some of the basic hawks in flight. And um, in particular, I think this is David Sibley's first, um, first publication. And I actually think his stuff is wonderful. He really captures the spirit of the birds, especially in flight. And um, I have to also mention that we're gonna use some of those resources here for this presentation. And also there's a, a program from Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Raptor ID. And Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Birds of North America, you can get wonderful information from that resource. We're gonna kick off with just a little bit about the fall migration. Um, this is actually from Hawk Mountain. And if you'll take a look, you'll notice that, you know, if we draw down, this is the month of September. If we draw down within the month of September, we notice that we are right now at the very cusp of the fall migration. You may have heard on the radio about all the birds flying last night, all the songbirds were flying last night. Songbirds are flying in the in the night, excuse me, at nighttime, and the hawks are migrating in the daytime. And the reason they're migrating in the daytime is they're taking advantage of the thermals of the daytime, the 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 different wing patterns, and especially when you get a northwest wind, that kind of gives them a push to be able to get that wind on their back, and they can make some serious time and save some energy. And I did want to make a, a little special mention about a couple things. If you take a look at this particular species, which we are going to talk about, which is the broadwing hawk. These guys are moving big time right now. September into early October is the prime migration. And it is the prime migration for this species because they're feeding primarily on reptiles and amphibians. And in this area, they're primarily feeding on on an awful lot of amphibians. And because of that, they're actually going to get out of the area very quickly because there are no uh, reptiles and amphibians in the middle of the winter that are easily accessible. So what that means is that these broad wing hawks are going to go on out. They're going to go down to Central America and South America. And I just took a look and it. They actually have been recorded as far south as Chile and Argentina. So that's quite a haul. But most of them are gonna be in the Amazon basin and also Central America. And they're gonna be hanging in wetlands down there, capturing those amphibians and reptiles. If we take a look at a species such as an osprey, we notice that they began their migration at the beginning of August and they go all the way through until November. And of course, if you wanna go chase golden eagles, that's gonna be in the middle of October is into November is your prime time to chase those species. Um, another group of species that are moving right now, the sharp shins and the Cooper's hawks are moving big time right now. You'll notice that the red tail hawks, red tail hawks are middle of October. So all these different species kind of move at different times. And then we have our falcons. You'll notice that they're primarily getting out of here by October, at least most of them, except for the resident species. Now the spring migration, you'll notice, again, this is from Hawk Mountain, you'll notice that it is more of a protracted migration. They're taking their time on the way back as compared to nest as compared to in the fall, they're really getting out as quickly as possible. And um, in the case of the spring migration, they're doing the opposite. Rather than waiting for those Northwest winds, they're actually looking for Southeast winds that are actually gonna push them north so that they can get to their breeding sites. So that's just a little bit about the spring migrate or the fall migration and the spring migration. Again, if you want to get out to the hawk stations, this is the prime time to get out. Some of the local hawk watch stations, we have Hawk Mountain, which is in Kempton, PA. Uh, this is the original sanctuary for hawks. Originally, the location was to shoot hawks. People would go up there and basically shoot the hawks as they were migrating over. And the challenge was to shoot as many as you could. At that particular time, hawks were considered pests and basically people just shot them whenever they could. And it wasn't until the regulations were put in that all of a sudden we have now seen certain species return. Um, and a matter of fact, even species like red tail hawks and Cooper's hawks, they were shot really, really bad. They were considered vermin and pests. And fortunately, that is no longer the case. We have Fort Washington State Park, which is in Militia Hill. 
We have Rose Tree Park, which is down in Media. Bake Oven Knob, which is in Germansville, PA. This is actually north of Hawk Mountain. Bucktoe Preserve in Avondale, PA, and Cape May Point State Park, which is down in South Jersey. Interesting point about the uh, these two, the difference between Hawk Mountain and Cape May State Park, uh, Cape May Point State Park, is that in Hawk Mountain, a lot of the birds are being filtered by the Appalachian Mountains. And in the case of the Cape May Point State Park, a lot of the birds are following down along the coast with their with their view on the left hand side of the coast and most of these birds are coming out of canada and um northern Penn, or uh, excuse me um upstate in new england and, and new york and places like that and in the case of cape may point state park the young birds are flying south and um all of a sudden they have their eye on the coast and they get to the Delaware Bay down at Cape May Point and all of a sudden they have to cross a big body of water and they're like, mm, I don't know if I can do that. So some of them actually backtrack and go up and cross at another location. Um, and others just fly across. Some species, it, it's not a problem to fly all over at all. And then Cape Hem Henlope in um, Delaware, that's actually on the other side of Cape May and the birds get picked up there. Um, Generally, when I think of birds, like the hawks identifying, I think of generally what you first see, is it a large, dark, soaring bird? Or is it a beautio? And a beautio, if you take a look, if we measure from wingtip to wingtip, it is longer than if we measure from head to tail. So typically, they're going to look a little shorter tail as compared to the length of the wings. And then our next category here, we have another category of raptors or hawks and this is the occipiters and in the case of the occipiter if you were to measure wingtip to wingtip compared to head to tail you'll notice boy that is a really long tail um, it's not exact but it's pretty doggone close when you're looking at an occipiter and occipiters are, are are basically birds that are feeding in the tangled thickets in the woods and they're very maneuverable because they're eating other birds and then we have our falcons. And of course the falcons have these incredible pointy wings. You don't see any of those frayed edges on what we call the primary feathers at the end. It's a long wingtip to wingtip and it's short head to tail, but look at how pointy those wings are. And then if we have a quick snapshot of these different types, you'll notice here we have our falcons, pointy wings, we have our occipiters, and you'll notice wingtip to wingtip, head to, head to tail is pretty close to the same size, rounded wings, not pointy. And then we have our beauties, which are wingtip to wingtip, head to tail. Those wingtips are, wingtip to wingtip is much longer than head to tail. Um, these are the broad categories for some of our hawks. And we're going to talk about some other species too. Okay. We first talk about large, dark soaring birds. We're gonna talk about bald eagle. We're gonna talk about turkey vulture, black vulture, osprey. And I'm just gonna throw in, just so you know, there are some dark morph beautios. Uh, they're not real common in our area, but they do show up. First species we're gonna talk about is the bald eagle. And bald eagles have this massive wingspan. Um, it could be six, six to seven feet long. Um, you'll notice in the case of the adult here, obvious white head, white tail, rest of the wingspan is very black. Um, when an eagle is soaring, you'll notice that the head projects out really far from the edge of this wing. So one of the things you can always do when you're looking for a bald eagle, if you have a large dark soaring bird coming at you, is to look for that neck projection. And that becomes necessary because it takes four years for bald eagles to become adults. And when the juveniles are young, you'll notice this scattering of random white on the underside. And um, it has the same neck projection, but all these scattering of white, white spots. Um, and as it gradually gets older, it is gonna to start to show more and more white at the tail and the head, at the tail and the head. Um, of course, this is the species that was annihilated in the continental US by DDT. 
uh, thanks to the uh, banning of DDT, it has now returned the DDT. Um, basically, it would thin their eggshells to the point where they couldn't in incubate their eggs and they would just crack. Um, thankfully, they have now returned and through a hacking program, they now nest in our area. Here's a classic example of an adult bald eagle. And again, when they soar, this is very flat. Wingtip to wingtip, very, very flat with that massive neck and head projection. Here's the adult from the back, white tail, white head. And then here's, here's a couple pictures of some juveniles. This is a juvenile in a perch position. And then we have, again, the spattering of white on the underside of the juvenile. Okay, now we're gonna just quick jump in a quick mention about this because occasionally they do come through. Um, golden eagles do come through within our area and mostly you'll see, you can see them at the Hawk Watch stations. Um, uh, Hawk Mountain does very well for golden eagles. These are actually birds that presently are nesting in northeastern Quebec. There's a population there that actually migrates down the Appalachian line and occasionally all the way to the coast. If we were to look at this bird compared to that bald eagle, you'll notice that there is just, uh, this is an adult bird, you'll notice that it's just a solid dark pattern. And believe it or not, you can't see it in this picture, but this bird is going to soar with a lot more of what we call a dihedral or a V pattern as compared to that really flat bald eagle. And I did forget to mention that the bald eagles are feeding on fish, but they also take coots and ducks off the water. They're pretty amazing. These guys here, unlike the bald eagles, and um, these guys are more inland. The bald eagles, I should have mentioned, are actually going to be primarily along the riverways and the coastlines and things like that. These guys are feeding on rabbits. Um, both bald eagles and golden eagles have no problem taking. Um, taking uh, carrion um, and you know they're, they're just, these guys are a little bit more more prone to be able to just take live prey they're pretty aggressive at that um, now there was at one time at the turn of the century golden eagles actually did attempt to nest in Pennsylvania and they did nest in upstate New York at the turn of the century now it's strictly within that Quebec region and then this is a classic golden eagle as a juvenile. And you'll notice that there's these two white patches here along the edge of the, these are secondaries and primaries, and then at the tail. This is a classic juvenile golden eagle. The neck or the head and the neck don't project as far as a bald eagle. Next, we're gonna talk about the most common large dark soaring bird in our area. This is the turkey vulture. And turkey vultures, are carrion eaters. They're actually more closely related to storks. And one of the things you'll notice, if you have a backlit, that is the sun's above it, um, turkey vulture, you'll notice that the primaries all the way down into the secondaries, these flight feathers and these lower flight feathers, here are all backlit and paler than this section here. It also has a kind of like a small beady head and then a longer tail. And these guys are that classic V pattern, as in the V in vulture. These guys, when they're soaring, they have this amazing ability to catch the thermals and to ride the thermals. A little bit of a trick I sometimes use if you have a hot day in the migration period for the hawks. If you see a bunch of kettling turkey vultures, you might want to take a look in amongst them, and you may find that there are some other hawks mixed in there because these guys grab the thermals so well. Uh, this is the position in the glide. This is the turkey vulture in the glide position. Again, that tail always projects out pretty far. And here's a, here's a, a classic example of turkey vultures in the perch. Pink head, naked head, and then here's the classic backlit feathering on a turkey vulture. Next, we're gonna talk about the black vulture. These guys just showed up into our area. I guess I saw my first one in like 1985 and they have continued to move north. Uh, I suspect it might be because there's a lot of dead deer in this area and all, their, all the other dead animals with the increased traffic and they really can take advantage of it. Um, you'll notice that if you take a look at the 
feathering here on the on the wings you'll notice that it's solid black except for these white gloves here at the end of the primaries of the flight feathers also notice how short the tail is um, while that turkey vulture has that classic v pattern these guys do not do a classic v pattern as a matter of fact they're not great soars at all and you'll frequently see them kind of flat 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 glide soar flap 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 it almost looks like they're going to fall out of the sky um, another trick i sometimes use is when these guys are soaring it's almost like the tail almost is going to match up to the edge of the of the uh, of the wing here as compared to that will never happen with a turkey vulture these guys are classic carrion feeders but they're also a little bit more aggressive i know a um, a local farmer in our area who who has lost many lambs, freshly dropped lambs to black vultures. They will actually, if the, if the parent doesn't protect at all, they'll basically kill the lamb and eat it. So um, yeah, it's, it, these guys are much, much more aggressive than the turkey vultures at, at, a, uh, at a living animal. Here's a classic example of uh, black vultures. Unlike that red head, these guys have a black naked head. Um, and then here's the position of the uh, bird in soar, and you see those white gloves that kind of stand out. Next large dark soaring bird is the osprey. And I always think of ospreys as seagulls. They almost feel like a seagull to me with this M pattern here. These long wings, they're kind of arced, and uh, these are fish eaters. And unlike the bald eagle, which kind of hits the fish or the duck off the top of the surface, these guys actually will plunge dive several feet down to grab a fish. They'll go both talons in on a stoop, put the talons straight forward, grab the fish, and then wrestle themselves out of the water and then fly off and feed. You'll notice here, there's an awful lot of black and white patterns. Most of the body and most of this wing portion here is all white. And then we have this splattering of black on the underside with these two little spots right here. Here's the position in the soar. Uh, and by the way, these guys do get chased by bald eagles and forced to drop their catches, their hard earned catches. I've actually seen it happen. And one particular time there was an osprey that got uh, parasitized or a uh, kleptoparasitic is uh, parasitized by a bald eagle and sure enough the same ball uh, the bald eagle who picked up the fish then got attacked by another bald eagle who made him drop it and then took the fish um, here's a classic example of a osprey in flight and here's a wonderful picture i think it's a blue fish it's an osprey with a blue fish uh, these guys are primarily fish eaters um, they have not really nested in our area as compared to the bald eagles. And that was always a surprise to us. We thought that the ospreys would nest in this region sooner than the bald eagles, but the bald eagles did, have taken over and they're doing very well. Next category we're gonna talk about are the beauty ears. These are the classic hawks that everybody thinks about. And again, wingtip to wingtip is longer than head to tail. And our first species we're gonna talk about is the red tail hawk. And red tail hawks are the most common uh, beautios within our area. They're the most successful. And part of the reason they're the most successful is that they're, most, they're the most variable in their diet. They'll eat squirrels, they'll eat rabbits, they'll eat mice, they'll eat snakes. Um, they're primarily the edge habitat at, at the edge of the woods where the field meets. That's where they really seem to do really well. That said, they're very successful even in places like Philadelphia. Down there, they're hunting rats and pigeons and they're actually very good at it. Um, it turns out if you have you know, the classic red tail, you'll, you'll notice on a classic red tail that it has a red tail, but you can't always go by that because juveniles do not have a red tail. So a little trick that you can sometimes use if you are trying to identify a red tail as a beautio is if you take a look at this little portion of the forewing on a juvenile, excuse me, on an adult and a juvenile, you'll see this little dark band that runs here along this edge. Plus there's frequently a belly band, a little bit of a belly band that shows up on a 
a little bit of a heads up wind migration. If you've ever been driving along 422 in the winter time, you'll notice about every mile there's a red tail hawk. Some of those red tail hawks might be birds that are from further up into Canada and they migrate to our area in the winter time just because there's not as much snow and there's easier access to the prey. And then here's the classic adult red tail and then here's the juvenile. And you'll notice that tail is not red, but you'll see there's the belly band and this is called the petechial marks or petechial line here along the edge of the forewing. Just a little bit of a heads up. Some of these guys will turn into dark morphs. Typically this is more to the west. If you go to a place like Washington State, this is what a red tail hawk looks like. There's a lot of variabilities on red tails. And part of the reason is that they have an incredible distribution, the incredible distribution in North America into, um, into Mexico. The next species we're gonna talk about is a bird that does nest up in your township. This is the red shoulder hawk. And this is a bird of deep woods and riparian corridors. So when we mean riparian corridors, river bottomlands, places like that, um, it almost is, it's almost like a cross between a red tail and the species we'll talk about after this in that it, it basically will feed on amphibians, mice, uh, birds. Uh, typically it's a little bit smaller prey items than the, um, than the um, red tail hawk. Um, one of the things you can look for on a red shoulder hawk are these beautiful crescents that are offset by these black wings. This is a case of a juvenile bird here. We have banding on the tail, this little bit, this is a juvenile and it's, it has black and white banding on the tail. Uh, there's these lines that kind of arc in underneath these secondary feathers, but this, this when this thing is soaring and it's back with these white crescents off of the black tips, it's just a really, really, it stands out. Now, when you get to an adult bird, you'll notice that those crescents are a little bit less, but they are still there. They're still there. You have the banded tail, these lines that run underneath these prime or these secondary feathers here. Um, these are actually just absolutely beautiful birds. Um, they are in migration or places further north. They'll come down into our area. We'll see them in the wintertime. They will be around here in the wintertime. Typically, they're going to go a little further south, but we do have them here in the wintertime. Um, here is a classic uh, adult red shoulder hawk. You can kind of see a little bit of the crescent, all these black lines on these feathering here on the secondaries here. It's a really pretty bird. And if you ever saw this bird from the back, there's this wonderful black and white check pattern on the wings that just really stands out um, like, like nothing else out there. The next species, this is the species that's gonna be moving through, actually this week is gonna be the prime week all the way into that first week in October. This is the broad wing hawk. This is the species I was telling you that is gonna get out of here because it's feeding primarily on reptiles and amphibians. Um, you'll notice one of the tricks that I use when I'm looking for a broad wing hawk is if it's soaring up above you and it looks like you know somebody has basically taken black outline on all the feathering and the tail and just kind of tried to offset that white even more so. Um, and typically that's just a cute little trick that you can use in order to look for a broad wing hawk. If you look at the adult, it has a dark body, but it still has this outline. And again, it looks like somebody took a crown and just outlined everything. Streaking on the breast. Um, as I said, these guys are gonna get out of here um, with, by the month, typically by the first week in October, they're pretty well out of our area, first or second week in October. Um, and then here's a, here's a picture of, of the actual bird. You can see this classic outline on the bay. black and white banded tail, this, dark, uh, this outline on these secondaries and primaries. And then this is a position of the bird perched. This one here, this is a broad wing also, and sometimes it's just, it's just a little bit of a, of a, of a um, little bit of a warning. Sometimes if the lighting is not right, you might not see the marks you're looking at. So you might want to try to look at some of the other marks too. Um, 
And in this particular case, it's very white in this section here. Okay, the next category we're going to talk about are the occipiters. Again, wingtip to wingtip is, is about the same as head to tail. And the first one we're going to talk about is a bird that nests in our area. And I saw my first nesting uh, Cooper's hawk probably in 1985. Um, this is, again, a, a bird that is hunting other birds. In my area, they love the morning doves. Um, as a matter of fact, that's their first choice. Uh, this is a juvenile bird, and you'll notice this fine streaking on the breast. And the other thing to look for is this very straight line with a pretty good head projection, uh, very T-shaped. So if we were to draw a line from here to here, it's very T-looking. Um, and the other thing to look at, you have this white at the edge of the tail. And typically, even in a glide position, you'll see a tail is rounded. And that's one of the things you can always look for for Cooper's hawks. Uh, these guys, when they're nesting, you may not even know that there's a nest in your neighborhood. They're that quiet. Um, but then once they get out, then the other birds will let you know when, <laughs> when you have a uh, Cooper's hawk in your area. Um, uh, this is another one of those species that was shot like crazy as vermin and has now returned to our area. Um, I'm going to go in a couple pictures here. Here's a classic Cooper's hawk. We have white at the tip, very long tail, and then we'll notice, look how far that head projections. Do want to make a little note, um, the eye, this is a juvenile bird, and um, for some hawks, the eye actually becomes more and more orange as it gets older. So this is a very pale eye, so this is a juvenile. And then here's another picture of a juvenile Cooper's hawk. A uh, little trick also in the perch position, some people describe the legs of a thickness of a pretzel rod on a Cooper's hawk as compared to the species we're gonna talk about next, which is the um, Sharpshin hawk, which is more the thickness of almost like a, uh, of a, pen, uh, a pencil as compared to a pretzel rod. Another thing to look for is the position of the eye and the head. If you were to, uh, if you were to draw a line about a quarter of the way through the head is where the eye sits. A, sh a sharp shin hawk, which we'll talk about next, typically is going to be closer to the center. At least it feels that way. At least it feels that way. Okay, so here's our sharp shin hawk. And here again, we don't have as deep of a T, um, not as straight, and the head doesn't project nearly as much. They're still white at the tip of the tail, but it doesn't feel like it's as much. It's a little bit more scattered, uh, darker stripes, uh, thicker stripes on the breast portion. Um, but in the glide position, you'll see that there's this little notch in the tail when it's folded. Uh, this is an adult bird, and then this is a juvenile. And you'll notice this is actually true to size. Uh, males and females are of different sizes, meaning I should say I should say a, an, an immature female on a sharp shin hawk is actually pretty close to the size of a Cooper's hawk um, male. And you'll see that this is this female is significantly larger. As a matter of fact, most uh, raptors, it's about 20% larger the females are. Um, and then here's a classic sharp shin hawk. This is a juvenile. You can see the, the much more streaking. You can see that the eye position is not, it's closer towards the center compared to that original Cooper's hawk we looked at. And then here's a bird that looks like to me it's transitioning to an adult. Sharp shin hawk. You can see the notch in the tail there. Again, these are bo both bird eaters. Um, Sharpies are smaller birds, and Coopers typically are anything from a flicker to uh, morning doves are their prime choice. Um, this is just, you know, again, these, there's a little bit of a, especially in the field, the size comparison between a um, adult male Coopers hawk and an adult female sharp shin is pretty close in the field. If you have them in your hand, it's another story, but if they're in the field, it's sometimes hard to just look at size alone. So that's why you wanna use a couple other characteristics if you can. Uh, next is we're gonna talk about this is the Northern Harrier. 
And Northern Harriers are kind of interesting to me because they have these really long wings, but they also have, and the, and the head's kind of small, but look how long the tail is. So it's almost like if you were crossing an occipiter with a buteo in some ways. It has these really long wings, but it also has this really long tail. This is an adult male, and again, they're smaller than the females. Um, and the adult males are typically gonna be white with these black tip wings, or black, black tips at the end of the wings, uh, black and white banded tail, and the females are just gonna have this streaking on it. These are birds of, of open space, especially fields and wetlands. Um, they come into our area and they will stay around in the fields all through the winter, feeding on meadow voles and, and birds and anything else they can capture. Um, you have these, these dark, uh, black and white bands on the tail and these long paddle looking wings. This is the adult male. It's this beautiful blue, uh, bluish gray. Um, it just really stands out. But a classic for the Northern Harrier is this white rump patch, uh, especially if you can get a view of them when they're flying over the fields. Now, one of the things I did want to mention, this is a bird that literally has that, that dihedral, just like a turkey vulture, but it, it's flying above the field in these patterns of, of that V pattern, catching any kind of wind that's out there. Uh, they're just very unique flight pattern on them. It's not flat like any other hawk. It just basically has a very, very unique flight pattern. And you'll see them out in the fields catching those meadow rolls and things like that. Uh, they are endangered within the state of Pennsylvania. Here's another view of the male. And then here's a view of the female. And then you have that white rum patch. The one little caveat I do want to mention is I have made many a mistake on a flying Cooper's hawk or a sipiter. If it's at the right angle, sometimes my mind kind of turns a little white patch at the corner here on a Cooper's hawk into a harrier. I've, I've made a mistake a couple times. And um, and basically had to then follow through on those additional characteristics. So if, you, if, you, uh, if you're looking at them from a side view, you might wanna, you might wanna you know, take a little bit more of a study. And then he, he, again, this is the female. One of the things I did wanna mention is, you'll notice this disc shape on the face. Uh, these guys and gals, they actually hunt the fields at dawn and dusk. And they, the suspicion is that they're using an awful lot of their hearing, almost like an owl, in order to grab the prey. So they don't need to be as reliant on sight as some of the other uh, raptors we're talking about. Okay, then we have our classic, the falcons. And these are, again, pointy wings that are long and pointy wings from end to end. First one we're gonna talk about is the peregrine falcon. This is another one of those species that took a major hit from DDT. Um, was, was actually extinct almost in the continental US except for the West Coast. It was definitely extinct on the East Coast and now has made a return to the point where it nests in our cities. Um, they nest in Norristown, they nest in Philadelphia, primarily under the bridges. They're eating the pigeons that live there. A uh, little fun story, I was down at a Phillies game early with my wife, and sure enough, there was a red-tailed hawk up on the, uh, the, the, the display board, and it's calling away, calling away, and then all of a sudden, it screams and flies off, and sure enough, a peregrine falcon perches in the same spot that it was at. So you can do a lot of bird watching even down at a Phillies game. Um, but the classic, I always think of these as like the Batman symbol. It's just those really sharp wings. Incredible flyers. There's nothing like watching a peregrine falcon chase after a bunch of shorebirds or stoop on a pigeon. Um, typically a fairly dark body on a juvenile, but there's these, these sideburns, these deep sideburns that really show up on an adult bird. This is an adult and this is a juvenile. And then here's a picture of a peregrine falcon, an adult in flight. And as I said, if you ever get a chance um, to see these guys in migration, if you go down to Cape May especially, it's going to be the first week in October. And you'll actually see them flying with shorebirds in their talons as they're going from point A to point B, uh, eating away. And um, I've actually, uh, 
I've actually seen them fly into 40 mile an hour winds and it's just amazing the capacity to fly. And that's why they, they, list, they live on every continent except for Antarctica. Then we have the mini peregrine falcon, which, I call the, which is called the Merlin. Again, we have the same pointy wings, this bat shape, very dark on the underside, very, very dark on the underside. This is again, a bird of open space. Uh, it's hunting primarily small birds, swallows, things of that nature, but it also feeds on dragonflies and, and birds like that, or excuse me, insects like that. Um, and I remember Pete Tun one time describing Merlins as having two speeds, fast and stop. And that is very true. They really do. They're either perched or they're in fast mode. There's no fluttering around, um, except if they're soaring and that's really high up. Here's a little tiny, little tiny Merlin. They're about the size of a robin maybe, uh, but they're little tiny killers. Uh, real pointy wings very dark on the underside. Uh, and these guys are, you know, they're primarily my, uh, breeding further north and they're coming down our area uh, in the fall migration. And then here's an adult bird. And the last one we're gonna talk about is the American Kestrel. American kestrels, again, are falcons, these pointy wings. These are birds of open space and especially farmland and field. Um, they are actually in, in, uh, in decline, significant decline, especially in our area, and primarily because of habitat changes. There's less open field if it's all subdivisions. There's no food for, a, for American kestrel in a subdivision. They're eating primarily um, insects and also they're eating mice and small birds. Um, so there's not as many mice in subdivisions. So these guys really have taken a hit and also pesticides are a major problem. Um, they do have these little tiny, again, this is about the size of a robin, these little tiny sideburns, you can see it here. Um, and one of the things you'll notice on an American kestrel, have you ever seen a very small bird that is hovering out above the field? It's most likely an American kestrel. And one of the things they do is they are able to see in ultraviolet um, and they can actually see the urine drops for small mice. So they can actually follow the tracks on where the mice are going. Um, it's a very pretty little bird. Um, here's a classic of an of a American kestrel with a, the, eating a dragonfly on the wing. They can just fast food it's a, at its best. This is the female. And then um, here, is a, um, here is an adult male. It has this beautiful blue gray on the edge of the wings, uh, a reddy, reddish mantle at the back here, and this blue gray at the top of the head. Oh, I forgot to mention, we're gonna get ready for our quiz. So this is gonna, you know, so in short, I mean, those are the categories and those are some of the tricks that I use in terms of identifying some of the different species. Um, so we'll go to our quiz and I'm gonna show you the first quiz. And first, this is gonna be in the category of a large dark soaring bird. And of course, if you see the white head and the white tail, this is our national symbol. This is the bald eagle. Gonna take a look at this one. You're gonna to have to decide whether or not this is a Buteo and a Cypriter. We know it's not a large dark soaring bird and we know it doesn't have pointy wings so we know it's not a falcon. So in this particular case, we're looking at a Buteo and the particular species we're looking at is a red tail hawk. And we're gonna judge that by, here we have our dark little bands here on the fore wings and a little bit of a belly band. Now we did make it a little tricky because this is a juvenile. Okay, this is a large dark soaring bird, but it has all this spattering of white on the underside. Um, and it's randomly in there, not at a specific spot at the corners of the, of the uh, secondaries and the primaries or even down here at the tail. And this is a juvenile bald eagle. This hawk here, you're gonna have to decide, is it a Buteo, is it a Cypiter? Um, you'll notice here 
it has all these beautiful black and white lines that run on the underside of the feathers. This dark pattern here uh, on the body as well as into the wings, this black and white banded tail. Uh, in this particular case, this is a beautio and this is going to be a red shoulder hawk. Now this one I think I actually got wrong a couple times on the quiz. Um, we have streaking on the breast. Uh, we, it's faint streaking on the breast. It looks like it has a pretty decent, uh, uh, per, uh, where the eye is in location to the head. It's actually only about a quarter of the way through, but we look here and we notice that it looks like it has a little notch in its tail. And usually you're gonna jump right into, oh, it's a Sharpshin hawk. But in reality, this is a Cooper's hawk and I suspect that he is missing his feather right here. And if he had that feather, then it might look a lot more rounded. This is an occipiter. Okay, in this particular case, we have pointy wings and we have the, um, this rustiness on the tail, black at the tip. And you'll have to decide if this is an occipiter, if it's a falcon or a buteo. And in this particular case, we're looking at a falcon and this is the American kestrel. And this is a really good tricky one. In this particular case, it looks like we might have some white crescents here, but they're kind of big cloppy windows here. The lighting is not perfect, but we start to see some black points here and here. Um, this is, if we're, if we're, you have to decide if it's a buteo or an occipiter. And in this particular case, if we measure from here to here, it's much longer than from head to tail. And in this particular case, we have streaking on the breast fairly pale on this zone here. Uh, this turns out to be a juvenile broadwing hawk. And then here we have dark streaking on the breast here. We have this classic notch in the tail and we have to decide, is this an occipiter or buteo? And in this particular case, this is an occipiter and this is a sharpshin hawk. This is a juvenile sharpshin hawk. And then we have this classic M pattern, arced wings, spattering of black and white on the underside. Uh, this is actually a osprey. And I think we have one more on the quiz. Extremely pointy wings, stark streaking on the breasts. We have this mustache here that comes down. This is a juvenile peregrine falcon. And I think that should be everything. I'm gonna go back up to the, just in case anybody has any questions. And I guess at this point, um, I guess I wanted to see if John, if there's any questions that I can answer. Yeah, Vince, that's, thank you so much. That's a great presentation. Very enjoyable, very educational. Um, and I think it has generated a lot of interest oh, because good. we have quite a few questions. Oh, good. I, I have to write them down. <laughs> now, I had encouraged everyone to ask some difficult questions. So <laughs> let's, let's see if we have some of those. <laughs> All right. So, so we do have a question about the vultures. Um, what about black vultures? Uh, did they have a better sense of smell than turkey vultures? So do the turkey vultures kind of follow the black vultures in order to find food? I do not know the exact answer to that question, but uh, I, I can give at least one educated guess. And okay. it has to do with the personal experience. I have a particular plant that smells like exactly like rotted meat when it flowers. And it flowers typically in a, late March, early April. And I can let you know that every time I have had the opportunity to put that flowering plant outside, I have had turkey vultures land on my roof. Mm. So yeah. I would go, I have never had a black vulture try to land on my roof. 
So I do suspect turkey vultures have excellent sense of smell to find dead prey. And I would not be surprised that a, that a black vulture would follow a turkey vulture to the prey. Okay, so you- And they will also, black vultures will also displace turkey vultures from a carcass. Because they're more aggressive. Because they're more aggressive, right. especially if they have numbers on their side. Mm, okay, good. Uh, here's another question. Uh, can you comment as to the likely impact of the West Coast wildfires and related air quality issues on hawks? Oh, boy. Boy, that is a really good Yeah, one. that's a good one. <laughs> And thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne, for asking a tough question. Yeah, that is a really tough question. And I think it's a good question. And I think it will have a major effect on the hawks, especially on the West Coast. Uh, it probably will not affect us on the East Coast, but the, I would suspect that the hawks on the West Coast will have some issues with that. Um, I don't know exactly what that would be. Um, I don't know if it most likely it would it would prevent them from being able to um, to migrate if it's in the middle of the fire they might have mm -hmm. to take some time down um, and mostly because I just couldn't imagine them actually having to fly in those conditions with that much smoke if it's having if it's a challenge for people to breathe in Seattle I would think it's a major a challenge for them to be able to breathe in migration, the hawks in migration. Mm, yeah. But I, I, I'm sure that there will be some stuff that will come out about, you know, those effects from those fires. Right. And I mean, I think the important, well, another important point that you made is that, you know, unlike songbirds that migrate at night and in the dark, Hawks migrate during the day when they can catch the thermals, um, you know, and when vision perhaps becomes more important, and that's going to be certainly impacted negatively by all the smoke. Yeah. All right. Um, another question. Uh, a few of my neighbors, and myself included, were, quote, attacked by a hawk in early summer as we were walking by the tree wow. where it had nested. Is that unusual? Wow. Mm. Um, it's not unheard of, depending on if you get too close to certain species. I wish I had known what species that, that was, but I, I would not be surprised uh, that some, some birds can get really kind of testy at a nest. Um, I have not personally had that experience, but I would <laughs> not be surprised that you could have a, a particular um, a particular bird that would really be upset at a human getting too close to a nest. Um, I can share one anecdote, and that was with a red-shouldered hawk that was nesting very near our house. Um, and we observed them actually uh, taking prey that they had delivered to their nestlings and hiding it on the ground. Hmm. And when you got close to where they were caching that food, they would come by and let you know they were very displeased. <laughs> so I certainly know red shoulders, not, not because of proximity to the nest, but because of proximity to the food that they had just, in essence, hidden away. Yeah. All right, we have, like I said, we have more questions. Um, uh, the raptors that eat carrion, uh, are the vultures included, are they any, at any risk for catching a wasting disease such as uh, hemorrhagic disease from deer? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know about raptors in general, but I do know that vultures in particular have an incredible acidic digestive system that necessary for it to break mm -hmm. down just about anything. So I know in the case of the vultures that they have really good systems to break down any, you know, biological toxic stuff. So botulism or whatever else it might be, I think mm -hmm. that they have the capacity to be able to, you know, deal with it as compared to, I don't know about, um, you know, um, hawks in general, because a lot of them, like some of them, I've seen red tails eat 
carrying uh, on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the Eagles do all the time. Um, but, I, you know, I have never heard of, you know, any, you know, and especially because I, I think the wasting question has to do with deer in particular. Um, <laughs> there are deer out there that are running around with chronic wasting disease. And I would think that um, their lifespan you know, is probably sh too short for it to really be the same effect that people would have. In other words, they might be in decline, the bird might be in decline at the same time that the chronic wasting disease would be occurring. Uh, it's my suspicion. Yeah, well, in, in an our area, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a, a significant outbreak of epizootic hemorrhagic disease, EHD, in the deer that really wiped out our white-tailed deer population. Um, I do know that that disease doesn't pass from the deer to yeah. any anything else that eats the deer. I mean, it's it's horrible for the deer, but it doesn't get passed on. Uh, chronic wasting disease might because that is a prion disease. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody does ask, can you send us the presentation charts? The, this is being recorded, so you can certainly go back and, and look at everything again. Um, another question, um, when raptors return from migration, do they settle in the same general area or do they relocate to a completely different area? That's a, that's a really good question. And I, I think it's a really good question because there are some species like eagles, who are very loyal to their particular nest. Right. And I think red tails are very loyal to their particular nest. However, Cooper's hawks, they just don't seem to care. Like in other words, <laughs> they seem to maybe, I don't know if they come back to the same area because I've never seen a Cooper's hawk occupy the same nest twice. Um, so I, I think it's probably a mixed I think some are very loyal to their spots. I'm sure the vultures are very loyal to their spots. I would, th if they can successfully nest, I would think the uh, red tails are very loyal to their nesting zone if they're successful. Um, but I think you know Cooper's hawks are not. I think I would think kestrels, since kestrels the nesting areas are so. Um, rare, I should say, not the nesting area, the nesting cavities are so rare, I would think they they try to be kind of loyal. So I think it's probably um, a fairly mixed bag. Uh, if if a pair, if a, if a group's come back from, if a group comes back from migration and the male and the female uh, meet up again, uh, they both survive the migration, um, they can get down to business pretty quick if they're in the same spot in the same location. So I think, you know, I think some are going to be fairly loyal, but then those Cooper's Hawks, I, I'm not aware of them being loyal at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question from that same person is also, are owls considered raptors and do they migrate south <laughs> for the winter? Some owls migrate and yeah. some owls do not. Your great horned owl, your screech owl, they're not migrating. Your barred owl are not migrating. However, your uh, sawwed owls are migrating. Your barn owls are migrating. Uh, at least some of them are migrating. So it's kind of a mixed, a mixed bag on those that are those that are migrating and those that aren't. Okay. Um, and, and and a question. Uh, we have a situation in our neighborhood where three houses adjacent to an open field have days where hawks perch on their roofs. Uh, Typically on a cloudy day, mm. I saw and counted 20 on a single roof. Any thoughts oh on God. this behavior? The next time you get 20 hawks on your roof, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I could think of is on a cloudy day, there's no, there's no, it's not really easy to fly out there. So they're finding a place to be able to, to settle down. And it sounds like on, on, your roof is just really nice. I'm sure that sounds horrendous with 20, mm -hmm. 20 sets of uh, talons running around on 
the top of the roof. But they, yeah, that's that's kind of an interesting. I have never heard of that before. That's yeah, I would be curious to know if they are if they are uh, uh, budios or if they might be uh, vultures. I've certainly seen vultures, you know, yeah. even in the day, yeah. numerous vultures, you know, kind of roosting on the same or in the same area, very close to one another. And vultures, vultures are notorious for that. They roost. They roost as a, as a group. Yeah. They roost as yeah. A group. All right, another one, uh, Vince, has the invasive stilt grass, which is a, mm. quite a, you know, issue up here and probably in a lot of other places. Has that interfered with the ability to successfully hunt rodents? Boy, <laughs> really good questions. Um, I would think not off the top of my head, but that said, um, the, the stilt grass is a problem in general. It's not mm, supposed to be yeah. part of our ecosystem. Um, it's um, <clears throat> it's not providing all the necessary foods that some of the other species of grasses would. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's because remember a lot of times you know there are, they can hunt by by sound and sight and even a. Um, a mouse amongst the stilt grass, I think that they could flush them out and find them uh, okay. simply by, by sight and sound. Excellent. All right. Well, Vince, it is, uh, it is almost eight o'clock, so I'm going to give you one last question. And this is not exactly a factual question, but it's a really good one. <laughs> um, and, and I'm curious to hear your answer because I've never asked you this. If you were a hawk, yeah. Which one would you be? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. If I was a hawk, yeah. I would go for, I would go for, boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> what did I say? Merlin? <laughs> my wife, my wife says it would be a Merlin. <laughs> ah, so that means actually, you, have, you have two I, speeds, I guess, I guess top I, speed and stopped. Yes. <laughs> I, I do tend to be a little bit like that. So I will go with that. <laughs> okay, there you have it. Vince would be a Merlin if he could choose. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Thanks for joining us, Vince. Thank you for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Obviously, based on the number of questions, there is a lot of uh, a lot of people who tuned in and a lot of people who are very interested in this. And you gave us some great information. Thank you. And to all of those of you who joined us this evening, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I hope that you have enjoyed this series of webinars and uh, look forward to hopefully holding more of these in the future. And with that, we will wrap up um, and wish everyone to uh, a, a nice evening and stay safe out there. <laughs>